Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and welcome. My name is David Jordan. I have the honor of being one of the pastors here at First Baptist Church of Decatur. We are thrilled to be hosting this amazing event tonight. We're so thankful for each of you. We are parents and grandparents, regular people, children of all ages, all enthralled by Misty Copeland. And so together we have a great treat in store. As a church in Decatur, we're thankful to be a part of this larger community. And we're always thankful for the Georgia Center for the Book. And uh, Joe Davich is going to be coming in just a moment and giving some instructions about other events that are going to be taking place. Before we do that, though, some practical things. There are restrooms, men's and women's restrooms at the bottom of the stairs uh, behind you. So if at any point during the evening, if you need to use the facilities, uh, you can access them that way. We're so glad that you're here. We're so thankful for those of you wearing masks. We appreciate that. They are uh, recommended, but not required. So we appreciate your, your honoring the safety of others. And welcome, and let us enjoy this evening together. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, David. It's always so nice to be over here at First Baptist. You know, we have a lovely auditorium over at the library, but it tops out at about 200 folks. So there would have been a lot of you um, who wouldn't have been able to get in this evening. And the relationship that we've had with First Baptist started about 14 years ago. Um, so for the past 14 years, we've been really able to do some large-scale programs and to allow as many readers and fans in as possible. So you can't do these things alone. Of course, I would like to thank Grand Central Publishing and Brave and Kind Books, local independent bookstore here tonight. They have signed copies. They are black owned and mom operated, so do support your local businesses as well. Would like to thank Rise City Dance, who are sitting behind me right now, for the wonderful presentation. Once again, please stick around for a few minutes right after we finish. Discab School of the Arts will also be performing for you all to kind of send us out on a high note to enjoy the holiday season. Um, just a few things, no flash photography and no recording. We want to be very, very respectful to our guests here this evening. And um, we will pull out a microphone and put it in the center. So after the formal presentation, if you all would like to ask questions, please come up to the microphone. We can't have all of you ask questions um, because, you know, we, some of us are a little older and we do need to get home and go to bed. Um, however, we will take about 10 to 15 questions. I am just going to say I think it would be a wonderful thing with so many young fans here this evening if we let the young fans come up to ask Misty questions first. I I think we all can agree to that. So I have the honor of introducing two fantastic and talented women tonight. Angela Harris is the Executive Artistic Director of Dance Canvas, and she will be our moderator for this evening. And of course, she really needs no introduction. She is a New York Times best-selling author and the principal dancer for the American Ballet Theater, Misty Copeland. behind me. I love this. Hi, y'all. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, and thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for the introduction. We are thrilled to be here today. I'm thrilled to be here. So am I. Um, and to have a conversation with Misty Copeland. We are thrilled to welcome you to the Atlanta area. Thank you so much. <laughs> and 
today we're just gonna spend some time getting to know Misty, learning about her life, her, her time dancing, her rise to principal status within American Ballet Theater, and then also about this wonderful new book that you've written about your mentor, Raven Wilkinson. So I'm excited to dive in. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> So, Misty, for our audience members who might not be as familiar with your background and how you started in ballet or how ballet found you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so, I was actually born in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, oh, we got some people in the house. Um, and my mother uh, moved to uh, Los Angeles when I was just two years old. Uh, <laughs> and uh, with me and my three siblings, um, she was a professional cheerleader for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, not, I mean, she loved to dance, but it was more because she loved football that she <laughs> that she became a professional cheerleader. But that's that. I guess that's where like the the root of um, um, my love of music and dance movement came from was um, my mom like, dancing around the house and, and music being like this constant, uh, I think, form of like connection and communication between me and my family. Uh, verbal communication was not our strength. And so movement and music was, uh, was that way for us to all connect. Um, but once we got to California, um, there was a lot of chaos in, in in, in my upbringing in, in the household. My mom married four times and um, we ended up with six six kids and um, she pretty much raised us on her own as a single mom. Um, so naturally we went to the Boys and Girls Club. Um, you know, the, the community center and that was across the street from my um, middle school and, and high school. Um, and it was a place for us to be while my mother was working several jobs. And um, it was there that I was doing discovered um, by the local ballet teacher who was uh, looking for more diverse students who wouldn't have the opportunity or access to classical ballet, and she was looking to bring them into her school on full scholarship. So I was 13 years old. I was literally forced into taking this ballet class, um, and it was on a basketball court. Um, I was in gym clothes and socks, and um, I didn't fall in love with it immediately. <laughs> Um, I was uh, actually, I think, six months, maybe I mean, a couple months prior to me f discovering ballet, I, um, I had just been named captain of the dance team at my middle school, which was a huge deal because I was so introverted, and it was not something that my family thought I could ever do because I didn't even want to speak in public, let alone be on a stage in front of people performing. Um, but it was, it, it just became um, something that I needed to do. It became a way of me communicating and expressing myself um, in a way that worked for me. And uh, I guess the rest is history. I love it. What, what about ballet especially um, drew you in and kept you there? Yeah, you know, I think that it... Um, there were so many things that I was missing in my life that ballet like fulfilled that need. Um, first of all, just I was constantly looking for a place to belong and and feel like I was a part of something that was bigger than myself. Um, and you know, all of the things that made me different or. I don't know, I felt awkward and ugly and uh, like I didn't fit in, you know, I had these massive feet and these like long skinny legs and this tiny little peanut head and all of these qualities were perfect for ballet. <laughs> and <laughs> I was beautiful when I entered the ballet studio. Um, and it was also, you know, the, f the first time that I felt comfortable in my skin. I felt like it was something for me that I wasn't sharing with my five siblings. Um, it was something that made me feel beautiful and that all of my unique qualities <laughs> and assets um, were you know, were accepted and um, and a strength. I love that, and the feeling of acceptance and the love of ballet led you to American Ballet Theater, which is a fabulous company. Um, 
what did you love about that company in particular um, as you started to dance within it? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question because, you know, as a, as a minority, as a woman of color, as a black woman in particular, it's, it's hard to find a company that has dancers that reflect you, that, um, that you can relate to, you can see yourselves through. And um, something that my, my first ballet teacher, Cynthia Bradley, was so great at. Um, she was a, a white, very eclectic Jewish woman. She was actually the lead singer of like a punk band before she started her ballet school. Um, she was a very unique woman, but she, um, she always made me feel uh, like this was a place that I could thrive in, like the ballet world was a place I could thrive in. And she made it clear that uh, from the moment I started training with her, she was introducing me to American Ballet Theater and their history and their background because of all of the top elite ballet companies in the world, American Ballet Theater has always been one that was very uh, diverse in terms of uh, dancers that come from all over the world. Uh, you don't have to come from their ballet school and train in their school in order to get into the company, which in, you know, you think of the Bolshoi or uh, the Royal Ballet, New York City Ballet, the Paris Opera Ballet, you pretty much have to train in their school so that you can get into the company. And ABT is just very diverse in terms of, you know, culturally what the, what the dan where the dancers come from, what they look like, their body types. Right. So she felt like it was a it was a company that I that if I were to join a, a major company, that that would be one that um, made sense for me. So that became my goal from from day one. From 13 years old, it wasn't like oh I'm going to take this extracurricular you know this ballet class for fun. Um, from the moment that I took that class on a basketball court, she said I think you're a prodigy, and um, if this is what you want to do, then we've got to get serious. And I was taking, you know, up to three ballet classes a day and um, ended up becoming a professional at American Ballet Theater after only four years of training. <laughs> so for those of you um, that might not know, four years of training is extraordinarily short amount of time to be, go from never having had a ballet class to becoming a professional ballet dancer, especially with American Ballet Theater. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, I, what I love hearing is your love of ballet because it's, it's my love too. I, I, I see all the beauty in it. I see the, the magic that happens when you step out in front of the lights and on stage and all of the, the beauty that's in the art form. And I'm, I would love that we led with that because that's the driving force, right? That's what keeps you in it. Um, but one of the things that you uh, mentioned is that you, your teacher was very, um, clear that she was going to help you find a diverse company and a company that um, celebrated differences and um, reflected the community. Can you tell us a little bit, especially for audience members that may not be in the ballet world, um, what are some of the challenges in the ballet world when it comes to diversity? Um, it's, it's a European art form. And, um, oh, I just saw that photo <laughs> that I didn't see. You guys can see it. Oh, Raven. Um, it's a European art form, and uh, for generations and generations, it's, it's not been inclusive of, um, of people of color. Uh, it's, it's really interesting because in terms of body types, I feel like it's, there's been such an, an evolution, not for the best necessarily, but in terms of body types, I feel like it's, it's changed a lot over the course of, you know, from the time, you know, you, you think about these Degas paintings and what the women looked like in those paintings, and they did not look like the ballerinas of today or even of, you know, 30, 40 years ago. You know, I think about George Balanchine, who really changed the aesthetic of what ballerinas looked like, and it was really uh, in that time of, you know, the 60s, and you think about Twiggy and these supermodels of that time, and that was really what the ballerinas ended up looking like, and I feel like today, that's the imagery that we think of when we think of a, of a ballet dancer. You think of a very thin, uh, frail, white woman, um, and, and that's kind of been the aesthetic that's that's been formed, um, and it's not been inclusive of um, specifically of, for black women. 
Um, so, you know, it's to be in a major ballet company, um, it's extremely difficult to get into. Uh, and, you know, when you think about certain ballets, um, it's really kind of been shaped over time to really exclude people of color. There are literally a genre, there's a, a genre of ballets called the Ballet Blancs, um, which translates to white ballets. And, uh, you know, it's where all the dancers uh, look uniform. They all have white skin and they all wear white tulle. Um, and so for a brown body to be a part of that, you know, we've been told over for many generations that black women will um, break the, the line. The, they will ruin the aesthetic. Of, of that uniform, um, unison look. So, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of challenges when it comes to um, just fitting in um, and and changing what that uh, image looks like. And that's been so much a part of my mission since I became a professional dancer. It's kind of going back in, in our love of ballet. You know, I, I love the, the history of it and being a part of something that uh, has so much history and that's so much bigger than me, but getting to the root of, of the purpose and, and why ballet was formed and what we're doing. And um, we're there to tell a story through our bodies. And it shouldn't have anything to do with what we look like, really. You know, it's what you're bringing from inside and how you're making the audience feel. So that's always been in the back of my mind as my goal. And that's what I love about these full-length story ballets. Well, some of them, some of them are problematic and need to move, we need to move on from. But a lot of them, like, it's, it's incredible to take on these characters um, and be an actress on stage and tell a story. Yeah, yeah. And I think, too, um, when I saw that you wrote this book about Raven and um, your, her being your mentor, I think it's really um, incredible that ballet hasn't evolved a whole lot. Um, and I'm just wondering, as we start to dive into your relationship with Raven. Um, if you could tell our audiences maybe some of the stories she shared with you about her experiences when she was coming up in the ballet world. Yeah. Um, Raven, uh, is, she was an incredible woman. Um, and you're right, a lot has not changed in 50, 60 years, however long since Raven uh, joined the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. Um, but she uh, was the first black ballerina, really, to receive um, a, a major a contract with a major ballet company, and um, really, I think, like the first American ballet company, the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, uh, one of the most um, important ballet companies of the 20th century. Uh, she joined in 1955 and was the first and only black woman to dance in that company. Um, and what's unbelievable is that I had no idea that Raven even existed existed and that she danced in this incredible company um, that has made such an impact on, on the ballet world and, and on America. Um, she uh, was a part of a documentary on the Ballet Russe. Um, I was home one Saturday night in my 20s. I should have probably been out at the club, but I wasn't. I was like being a bunhead and I was like, I want to learn as much as I can about this world. Um, and it, it changed, that night changed my life. Um, you know, I, I saw this black woman come onto the screen and, and it was the first time that I felt like I had a purpose that was bigger than me. And to know that, uh, you know, what she was going through, I mean, clearly what I'm going through is nowhere near the adversity that she experienced in terms of racism in the 1950s, but um, that I had uh, a responsibility to share her story and, and get it out there to more people. Um, but Raven, uh, she danced for the Ballet Russe, um, I think only two years after she joined, she was promoted to soloist, which is, even to this day, that's like unheard of for a black woman. So to think of in 1957, uh, it was unbelievable. And it, it just really showed how talented she was. Um, she danced for the company for about seven years. Um, they toured a lot through the South. 
Um, she performed a lot in Atlanta, um, but she experienced a lot of adversity. Um, she, her life was being threatened by the KKK, and she ended up leaving the company eventually and moving to Amsterdam to, um, to dance professionally there with the Dutch National Ballet. Um, but after learning of her story, um, a year later, we, we met. I found out that she lived a block away from me on the Upper West Side in New York City. It was unbelievable. Um, and, and she was just a huge part of my life. And um, you know, the stories that she would share and the, the lessons that I learned from her, you know, she was such a unique mentor. Um, she wasn't someone that would you know, kind of sit me down and you know, as, as ballet dancers, you know, she wouldn't give me corrections after a performance. Like, that wasn't the kind of mentor or teacher that she was. Um, she was a fan and a champion of me, but she would just share these stories and her experiences of, of um, things that she had to overcome. And um, it wasn't about, again, just saying these are the things I'm teaching you, but it was me kind of deciphering like what are the lessons in these stories that she's telling me, and it was such a beautiful way of um, you know leading by example. The way that she handled herself in so many unbelievable circumstances, she showed me what it was to have humility and grace and empathy. I love that. I um, I was reading a passage from the book um, where you went in and saw a cast list of, I think, Sleeping Beauty, um, and uh, your name wasn't in one of the roles that it should have been in, um, and your conversation with her and how she made you think about the situation differently, and then how that changed how you reacted to it. Um, I'd love for you to share the, that story, if you don't mind. Yeah, you know, I think that it's something that's so um, ingrained in us as ballet dancers. It's just a part of the culture where we're not really, um, it's not like reinforced that we should have a voice, you know, that we use our bodies to, to communicate and to speak. Um, and that, you know, that we're not really taught to be, um, to advocate for ourselves and have agency over our careers. Um, and so that's a really difficult thing as a professional when you are um, you are not getting opportunities and then you um, don't know how to have these kinds of conversations with your boss or your artistic director. Um, so yes, I was I had been a soloist in the company, and as a soloist, you typically are cast in soloist roles. <laughs> um, you are no longer in the corps de ballet. You are not yet a principal dancer, but um, there's a role of Princess Florine in the Sleeping Beauty, which she dances the potida with the bluebird. That's the famous bluebird potida, and um, all of the soloists in the company were cast in this role except for me. Um, and it was just really shocking because I had done comparable roles in other classical works. Um, and, you know, typically I would say t to myself, um, well, I'm, I'm, there must be something wrong. I must not be talented enough. I must not have the right look or whatever it is they're looking for and then not say anything and just hold it all in. And after, you know, having conversations with Raven, it was... She was always just really um, uh, thoughtful, and um, things were just simple. She was like, well, go talk to your boss. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, I guess I could do that. Um, she's like, I'm sure you're not the first dancer in history to ask for a role, um, and a role that you should be dancing. Um, but one of the more, like, I don't know if it was shocking, but... Um, you know, to go into Kevin McKenzie, the artistic director of American Valley Theater's office, and for him to not even realize that, you know, he thought I was cast, and he actually thought I had performed the role before, um, which was shocking, and um, was like, no, I've never danced this part, never even learned the role, um, and he was like, oh, well, it's just an oversight, and I feel like that's, you know, it was, it was kind of like, well, how many oversights have there been throughout the course of my career, and it's just so fascinating that, you know, black dancers are told that we don't fit in, we, we stand out too much, but at the same time, we're not seen or heard. 
Um, and it, you know, it was just one of those moments where I realized just how important it was for me to have a voice and for me to stand up for myself. And, and it was so simple in the way that Raven just kind of coached me um, and, and pushed me to, to, to do that, to really to be an adult um, and stand up for myself. I love to hear that too, especially with so many young artists in the room, because I think in our, in our ballet training, we spend so much time not talking. We're at the bar, we're, we're getting choreography put onto us. We're not in a position like other industries where you would have those conversations with your bosses. And, and I do think it is a skill that sometimes we aren't developed in. So it, it, when I read that particular part of your book, it really kind of hit the nail on the head with how um, just reframing what it is to be a, a dancer and how you can have that communication, especially exactly. when you feel like an injustice has been done. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. How, um, as you've been um, coming up in the ranks at ABT, how has that been, both as a ballerina, but as a black ballerina as well? Um, it's been a long road. <laughs> um, you know, for, I'd, for people who are, aren't familiar with, you know, um, the, the ballet world and um, the trajectory, the typical trajectory of a, of a professional dancer. Um, when you join a company, you know, there's the, there's the corps de ballet, which is the large group of dancers um, that frame the dancers in the center. They create the atmosphere. Um, they work incredibly hard. Uh, one of the hardest roles I've ever had, to, you know, to, to be uh, a part of the corps de ballet. Um, and then there's the rank of soloist, and you do featured roles, and there's the principal dancer. That's, uh, they're the lead. That's typically what, like, an American ballet company, the structure is. Um, and, you know, when you join a company, uh, the, the artistic staff pretty much, you know, there are dancers, of course, that will grow and um, in maybe change the, your, the way you think about uh, who, what, their, what their path might be. But pretty much when you join a company, uh, they know which dancers are, they're going to have their eye on and start to nurture to become soloists and principals. But um, in my case, I spent seven or eight years in the corps de ballet, which is usually if you're in the company, if you're in the corps for that long, like you're not moving up. <laughs> Um, I was then promoted to soloist, and I spent seven years as a soloist. Again, if you're a soloist for that long, you're never going to become a principal dancer. So for me to spend 15 years in the company before I was even given the opportunity to do a principal role and then to be promoted um, is not the typical path um, of, of a dancer. So I knew, though, that from the moment that I started dancing that I didn't have the typical you know, journey of, of, you know, of a dancer. And so I never allowed myself to, um, to think that I had to you know, look like the dancer next to me and, and have their, the same trajectory. Uh, so I just never gave up. Um, and it was, it was really, really difficult to watch you know, my colleagues and, and, and peers um, continue to get parts that I knew I could do and I knew I should be getting. And it, it, you know, my strength was having mentors in my life like Raven and so many other incredible women um, in my corner that were there to remind me day in and day out that I could do it and like be that strength for me um, and, and keep me on, on track and, and focused. But it was really difficult. You know, the first 10 years of my career, I was the only black woman in a company of 90 dancers. Um, and and it's, it's really difficult every day to be surrounded by people that um, you know, don't really understand the, the microaggressions that you deal with on a daily basis, um, you know, and when I say that, you know, a lot of dancers of color have to work harder, it's not, it's not necessarily the work that you're doing in the studio, it's, it's, it's the, you know, 
um, day in and day out what you're what you're dealing with um, just by not feeling like you have support or people not understanding uh, you know what you're dealing with on your way to the studio that you're not coming in and you know it's it's just a whole different um, standard but um, I've had a unique path and I just you know I think it's a, a great example for so many dancers that don't feel like they fit this the mold um, to keep striving um, and and have a goal in mind and work towards that goal and make sure you have support uh, around you. I love that. And, and you mentioned that um, now there are other black ballerinas in ABT, which wasn't the case when you were coming up through it. And with this idea of mentorship, um, how has your role changed within the company or even just in, in the ballet world in general, as you are principal dancer, you're Misty Copeland. How, how, does, how, do you, um, how do you feel that has affected both you and the industry? Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting because I feel like, you know, initially when, when I started working with my manager about 10 years ago, and, um, and I started to really um, develop, you know, a name for myself and, and, and uh, bring ballet to people in a way that um, was special to me, it, uh, it wasn't so much about um, the ballet industry, like understanding, uh, you know, in the beginning when I was getting endorsement deals for with Under Armour and Seiko and Barbie, even all of these things, um, the ballet world didn't really get it. They felt like it was a distraction. Um, they didn't understand, you know, they felt like maybe it was taking away from the work that I was doing in the studio, which that was the first thing with every every partnership that I have, um, and my manager has learned along the way because she doesn't come from the ballet world. Um, was that ballet was first and foremost. Like if I had a photo shoot on my one day off, um, they you know, for those of you who don't know, like in these shoots you start at like six a.m. I'm like, sorry, I have ballet class. We got to start at eleven or whatever time. Like that was always you know my first priority. But um, it's been a huge. Um, it's taken a long time for the ballet world to catch up to what it was I was doing and why. You know, all of the opportunities that I've taken, it's like a, my mission and my goal has always been to, been to bring ballet to more people, to bring more diversity uh, into the ballet world. And, um, you know, they've, they've, you know, it's taken them time, but they understand now <laughs> that I'm in this position. But I feel like at this point, um, you know, you were talking about like how there are more dancers of color in the company and in, in companies all over the world. Um, and I really feel like at this point, it's about me supporting these dancers and, and, and giving them an opportunity to have a voice, um, you know, especially after the last three years, you know, post, well, I don't know if it's post pandemic yet, but uh, <laughs> after, you know, pandemic wise and the murder of George Floyd, um, it's, it's really been important for us to, um, to lift up black dancers um, and, uh, and for them to be able to speak about what it is that they experience day in and day out. And I feel like we're in such a different place than I could have ever imagined in the ballet community. Like more progress has been made in the last three years than I've, than I've seen in the 25 years I've been a part of the ballet world. Yeah. yeah. And hearing, hearing, you, hearing you say the pushback that you got when it was, um, you were first doing a lot of these like promotional activities, it's kind of mind-boggling because it really is. <laughs> I, I mean, I hope they see the dollars that came in because of it. But I mean, the more people that are exposed to the art form, the more audiences are going to be in this exactly, seat. exactly. And the more people that can see themselves on stage, the more people will come to the ballet. So, I think the visibility that you have through the the conscious work that you've been doing in terms of promotion and also getting out there definitely does open up the ballet world to people who might not have taken a look before. Yeah, and it's it's like 
it seems so obvious, but you know, it's like you, I literally had to be cast in a principal role, put on the stage, um, and then have me and my manager literally doing all of the work to bring awareness to these performances, especially to the black community, because that's not what ABT was doing. Um, and for them to then see, once we had done all that work, you know, years and years of um, work that I'm so proud of, um, you know, with my first performance of the Firebird in New York City at the Metropolitan Opera House, it was the first time that they saw the, the Met almost full of black and brown people and young people and you know sold out shows and and then it was like oh that's what this means <laughs> and it's like you know but you know it's it's seems so simple. I mean, it's not that simple, but, you know, for young people to come into the audience and see themselves reflected, and not just because of the color of my skin, it's, you know, so many other things that they could be connecting to, um, having a curvier body or being more athletic and muscular, or maybe they felt they were too short to be in this field or whatever it is, just to come and see the beauty and the diversity of bodies and talent on the stage, um, you know, that's what should be reflected in the audience as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the only way the art form continues. Exactly. You know, that's the conversation that's been had for like 30 years, 30 plus years is like this dying art form, like how do we keep it alive? And it's like, well, it, we have to tell stories that reflect who we are today. And, and um, you know, that's a part of the evolution of ballet too that we're just now getting to is how do, we, how do we start to create, you know, we were talking about your friend Christopher Rudd and how do we start to create works that reflect all communities and, and I am proud that, you know, ABT just um, this past, uh, was it spring, fall? I don't know. I don't even know what month it is. Um, that the company put on their first, um, it was an all black production with Christopher Rudd being a black choreographer. We had a black composer, a black conductor, a black uh, costume designer, and it was an all black cast at American Ballet Theater. I never thought I'd see the day. <laughs> I love that. And, and I'm just going to say out loud, too, when those things happen, we need to go see them and support them so they'll continue to happen, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before I open it up to um, questions, I, I want to circle back to this idea of mentorship. Um, I was sharing a little story backstage about how Raven has a connection to DeKalb County. She um, would visit Atlanta often, and when she came to this area, she would go to DeKalb School of the Arts, and she coached the students there on Sleeping Beauty. and and. Um, and one of the Auroras from DeKalb School for the Arts Sleeping Beauty actually became pen pals with Raven. So um, hearing some of the stories that you had of her, um, how do you think her legacy lives on through you? Oh my gosh, I mean, I truly don't think that I would be a principal dancer had I not been introduced to her. And, um, you know, she really, again, like she gave me this push um, to, to go further, you know, after 15 years in the company, it was like, what am I, you know, I had those moments, like, what am I doing here? Is this, is this really gonna happen for me? Is this really the path for me? And Raven made me understand like the importance of carrying on her legacy, but not just her, like the, the reason the book is called The Wind at My Back is Raven would say that to me before every performance. She would leave a voicemail or we would talk in person or on the phone and, and she would say, whenever you're on the stage, let me be the wind at your back. And, and it wasn't just about her. It was like so many black dancers that have come before me who are on the stage with me, like pushing me forward. Um, and, and so, you know, I just feel like it's a part of my responsibility, a part of why I'm here is to share her story, to share their stories. You know, I'm so proud of this book, but also of Black Ballerinas, the book that came out last year. And there are so many other stories that need to be told, but if, you know, if the ballet world isn't going to write our history or the world isn't going to write our history, we have to do it ourselves. So one last question. 
Um, if you were looking back, or actually if you're looking out at these lovely young people all in the audience, and you um, were giving them a piece of advice, especially young um, black ballet dancers that might want to pursue this field and a career in it, um, what would your advice be? Yeah, you know, I think in general, you know, no matter what your background is or what community you come from. I think it's so important to know that you are on your own path and that you don't, you know, it's so important not to compare yourself to other people. And um, what's so beautiful about, you know, being surrounded by other dancers is learning from them. That's something that I, it took me many years to, to understand. Um, and it took many injuries of being like out of the studio and, and wanting to be back in it. Um, but looking around me and thinking like, oh my gosh, there's so much beauty and there's so much stuff to learn from the dancers next to me. Um, but it's, it's really important just to know that there's so much power in being yourself and being a unique individual um, and, and knowing that it's not a weakness by having to ask for help or guidance or support. That has been my biggest strength is having amazing uh, support in my life and amazing, especially women that have been behind me um, every step of the way. I love it. I love it. So now it's your turn to ask questions. So um, Joe's coming up with the mic. And let's say if you have a question that you would like to ask Misty, if you can just get in a line behind the mic here. Oh my goodness. I love seeing all these little ones. <laughs> oh, please don't oh run. We're going we're gonna to try to take as many questions as possible. but. Line up in a organized fashion. You're going to be here all night. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, folks, that may be a little too many. <laughs> Just, you know. We do need to get Misty back home at a reasonable hour. So let's start with about 10. So everyone behind the lady with the glasses on top of her head, wave, 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 wave. Just go ahead and maybe just sit down behind her gently, gently sit down behind her and we'll see if we can get to this, okay? No, sorry. What is some advice for when you dance on stage in front of a lot of people? Oh, thank you for that. That's like a great question. Um, I think it's so important to remember what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. I think that often we get so carried away and we get, um, we think about who's in the audience and maybe what people are thinking or anticipating something bad that might happen. Um, I think it's important to remember that you're, you're doing it because you love it and, and that the people in the audience are there to support you, remembering that, that they're there to be entertained. They're not coming to, you know, to see, wait for someone to fall or make a mistake, um, but that, you know, it's important just to remember why you're performing and why you're on stage. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hello. Hold on a second. Okay. Um, I'm a ballerina right now, so is there any advice to be a good ballerina just like you? <laughs> You know, hard, hard work. <laughs> I think that um, it's important to make sure that you're consistent and you go to class every day <laughs> and you put in the hard work. But I think what's equally as important that we often forget, even as professionals, is that rest is just as important. Hi. Did you, did you really? 
Yes, I did. Um, Coppelia is one of my favorite ballets because of the incredible story. I love story ballets that have so many layers to it and that are so much fun and that have like different types of dancing and Coppelia is just like such a cool ballet for kids. Is that, what is that? Is that bun head you're holding that has the story of Coppelia in it? Very cool. <laughs> What was your favorite performance that you have danced to? Ah, uh -huh. um, Romeo and Juliet is probably my favorite ballet, um, and Juliet my favorite role to perform, but um, I did some performances with a company in Milan called La Scala Ballet. Um, to be in Italy performing that ballet with one of uh, Italy's biggest ballet superstars, Roberto Bolle, um, was like a dream come true. Yeah. Also, some performances I've danced with Prince were probably up there too. <laughs> And also, like, off the top of your head, do you know how many uh, ballets you've performed in? What was the first question? Um, how long did it take you to write the book? To write oh, book. to write a book. Oh, um, oh, the books happen so fast. When you've got a publisher that's pushing you. <laughs> um, this book, let's see, this book probably took me, like, eight or nine months. Um, I finished it a week after I gave birth to my son, which was really crazy <laughs> to be, <laughs> yeah. And it's his eight month birthday. Yes, today is his eight month birthday. Um, uh, how many ballets have I performed in? Oh my goodness, I can't count. Um, over 50 for sure, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What would you tell yourself if you ever thought of giving up? Oh, um, well, I've had to tell myself when, in times when I have thought of giving up, um, you know, is, is remembering again, like, why, why I do this. Um, I think that's something that we should remind ourselves of daily um, because it's so, it's so easy to get caught up in, um, you know, those times when you're exhausted um, or you have so much anxiety about performing. But again, it's remembering, you know, the love and the passion for, for the art form. Thank you. <laughs> As a as a black ballerina, what specific microaggressions have you experienced? <laughs> that is a very good question. You know, I think one that's, that's you know, uh, that is so universal for black dancers um, is, you know, simply, you know, the, the costumes and the makeup and the tights that we wear, the color of the ballet slippers, you know, the, the, you see all these images of me and, and I can't wait to get back on stage. I haven't been back on stage since I had my baby, but um, we're, we're in a different time where a lot of top ballet companies are um, allowing for black and brown dancers to wear tights that are their skin color. And that right there, you know, that... Um, Having, having tights and ballet slippers that are literally called, the color is European pink, that right there is just, it's telling you, you don't belong in this world, you don't belong in this field, um, that that's what the color of your skin should be in order to be a part of the ballet world. Um, and that's something that we're fighting to change. Thank you. I have two questions. Okay. Um, one is, have you ever had stage fright? What's the and other one? <laughs> and, the other one <laughs> and the other one was, what was your favorite part about dance? Oh, okay. Um, 
I have, you know, I've never been one that got nervous on stage. It was actually like everything outside of the theater was, gave me anxiety from like from when I was a child, you know, just being, being at school. I used to rehearse going to school. Like my mom used to take me in the summer and walk me through like where my classes were going to be because I was so anxious about being late or, you know, just, I, there was so much anxiety and uncertainty in my life. And ballet was the first thing that gave me the sense of stability um, and being on stage and, you know, not being able to see the faces in the crowd, but just feeling like I was up there expressing myself in a way that suited me, you know, through my body. I felt so safe on stage, like protected, like I was in this beautiful fairy tale bubble. Um, so this stage fright thing came later um, as an adult, as a professional, but that there was a lot of stuff that was connected to that, you know, probably doing my first round of Swan Lake performances, you know, because as black women, we've been told this is not a role that you can ever portray. You can never be the Swan Queen. So taking on that role as a black woman, the first at American Ballet Theater to perform it, there was so much pressure that I felt like if I, if I fail, what does that mean for the future of black dancers in this role. Um, those are the things I was thinking about before going on stage, and it's, it's not a healthy way to approach performing. Um, and again, it was having those conversations with Raven before that like got me grounded again in understanding like the mission and, 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 and my purpose. Um, and the second question, I forgot that one already, The Sorry. second question was... Um, did you forget to? <laughs> what was your favorite? Oh, what was your favorite thing about dance? Oh, my favorite thing about performing. I love performing. Me too. <laughs> So before you go on stage, is there anything that you tell yourself to maybe calm you down? Hmm. Um, you know, I don't really have like any rituals or things that I that I do before performing. Um, I like to just keep things really like calm and uh, but that's how I approach my everyday life like even before class um, before like I don't change when I'm eating um, but I like to just do things that that I would do on a on a everyday basis so like I love to have music playing in my dressing room and and that can be like any kind of music. people think I'm crazy when I like got Drake playing before Swan Lake and they're like how is this getting you prepared and I'm like well it just it makes me feel like grounded and like I'm just you know like it gets rid of all the like nerves and everything um, but I guess the one kind of ritual that I have is just like going on stage prior to like uh, any other dancers being out there there's no one in the in the audience and just like feeling the floor and the energy and just getting used to like that atmosphere thank you yeah hi um, what motivates you for you to be able to do um, a dance every year hmm. um, it's, it's so inspiring to think about the next generation of dancers and, and young people that, um, that are looking at me and that are looking at us on the stage. And, you know, the same way that, I, that I've looked at Raven and her career and her path and how it's pushed me, um, that you guys inspire me and motivate me. Thank you. Hi. Hi. What was your biggest challenge to your dance career and how did you overcome it? Ah, I've, I've had a lot of, have a lot of challenges. Um, one of the harder, you know, injuries, dealing with, dealing with injuries, it can be really tough uh, for dancers and, and for, for young people, you know, when you feel like um, if you miss, you know, a month that it's the end of the world and that you're, you know, you're going to fall behind. Um, and, you know, it's about being patient and taking care of yourself. And there's still so much learning to do when you're not on your feet and, and, and performing. Um, one of the worst injuries that I had was at the worst time in my professional career. It was right after I had been uh, given my first principal role of the Firebird. I had done my first performance in New York City to 
that an amazing audience of diversity. Um, and, uh, and then the following day, I had to pull out of the season and, and wouldn't perform for almost a year because I found out I had six stress fractures in my tibia. And I ended up having a plate screwed in um, and was told I was never going to dance again. Um, but I found a surgeon that's, that said he, he could get me on stage. And, um, and it was really just about continuing to work on things that I had control over. So though I couldn't stand or walk, I started doing floor bar. So I was taking ballet bar and laying down on my back and my side and my stomach um, and continuing to work on artistic things like with my upper body that I could control. So it was, it was having, again, like t finding, doing the research, finding the right team of people and um, teachers that uh, could work with the uh, you know, limitations. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, what was your main goal that you wanted to achieve um, during your dance career? Um, well, I think that initially, like, it was becoming a principal dancer. Um, that was, you know, when I joined the company, that was what I was striving for. But I think beyond that, what it became was, um, you know, how can I bring more people to this art form? How can I bring more diversity and, um, and get it out there to, to more people? And that's still my goal. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so my question isn't going to be as good as everyone else's, but what's like your favorite role that you performed in the Nutcracker? Oh, um, yeah, it depends on the version, uh, but I would say probably, I would say um, Clara. Um, it was the first part I ever did in the Nutcracker, and then one of my favorite versions of the Nutcracker was Debbie Allen's, uh, I think it's called Hot Chocolate Nutcracker now, but when I did it, it was called the Chocolate Nutcracker. Um, and uh, it was just an amazing experience to be a black ballet dancer on the stage, surrounded by so many dancers of color and, um, and doing so many different types of dance. So I would say that, of yeah, Clara is probably my, my all-time favorite. What's your favorite? Um, probably, I don't know, probably Party Child. Which a big party a child? Party. Oh, okay, <laughs> a lot of acting. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, what was your favorite memory from dance? Oh, hmm. Gosh, I, I'd say my. F this is a good one. Oh, well, how timely that this image came up, because this is probably one of the best moments of my entire ballet career. Um, this was after my first Swan Lake in New York City um, as the Swan Queen, and. Um, it's tradition in the theater world, but in, in the ballet world, that uh, the people who come on the stage and bring the ballerina the flowers at the end of the performance are um, the ushers, and they're typically men. Only men come on the stage and bring the flowers. So um, me and my manager, my team, we fought really hard to have two um, iconic black ballerinas be the ones that bring me the flowers. So we had Lauren Anderson, principal, former principal dancer with the Houston Ballet, black the first black ballerina there, and then Raven Wilkinson um, come on the stage and bring me flowers. And it was one of the most overwhelmingly emotional moments um, because I knew that, you know, what it meant for Raven to stand on that stage of the Metropolitan Opera House. You know, she never got that opportunity in her career. Um, and so it was like a passing of the torch. It was really special. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. How did Lauren Anderson help you in your career? Wow. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, Lauren has been just an incredible inspiration. First of all, just I remember being 15 years old and seeing her on the cover of Dance Magazine, I think it was, and just being so stunned to see someone, a ballerina with bright chocolate brown skin. I was like, what? Like, it was so foreign to me. Like, I couldn't... 
I couldn't understand what it was I was seeing because it was it was just so different and so special and like I connected with her. And then I met her for the first time when I was I think 19 or 20 when the ABT was touring through Houston and she just took me under her wing and it's like the power of representation but the power of be, of you know having people invest in you and connect with you. Um, it can last a lifetime and we've remained really close friends and just having her to be a support for me. I mean, I have stories in the book of actually about, about Lauren and, you know, having her there in the audience with me and giving me incredible feedback after my performances. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I just want to say thank you for letting us read your books that you made. And I also made this cereal box report oh. about you. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that for me? Can I have it? Okay. Thank you so much. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, is this you? Look at that leg. <laughs> Hi, Misty. Such an honor to talk to you tonight. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Uh, we went to D.C. in February 2020 to see you dance Giselle at oh the Kennedy no. Center. And unfortunately, you were injured. I said, oh, no, because I was injured and I didn't Yeah, do and Skylar Brandt danced it, and that was lovely. Um, but the question probably that everybody has is, when are we going to see you back on the stage? <laughs> That's like one of the toughest things as a performer is dealing with injury and like the disappointment of all the people that come. And I just want to thank you for supporting me and supporting the company and being there. Um, my plan is to be back on stage uh, in the fall winter of 2023. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi. Hi. Um, so I have one question for you. How did it feel to know that you're one of the best um, ballerinas in the company? <laughs> well, I don't think of myself in that way. I, I, I don't, I, I don't, you know, I think something that's so incredible, um, about ballet and that, it, you know, it's not a sport. Yes, we are athletes, but we aren't competing. Um, you know, it, there's there's not like a, a prize for the best ballet dancer. You know, we're all just trying our best and putting our best foot forward and trying to make an impression on the audience. And so I just feel so privileged to even have the opportunity to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question. It's, um, have you ever been treated differently because of the color of your skin in dance at a company? Yeah, I mean, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the, especially in the beginning of my career, it was really difficult. Um, again, just being young, you know, coming out of, fresh out of high school, I moved to New York City, um, and to not have people around me who really understood my my journey, understood what it was to, um, to be a, a black woman, uh, there definitely were times, you know, I, I don't know, I think about this article that came out in the New York Times called Where Are All the Black Swans? And, um, and I remember for the first time feeling like heard and seen by someone, you know, it, that was talking about these issues. And then to walk into American Ballet Theater and have no one understand what this article meant and feel like it wasn't even relevant was really heartbreaking. Um, and it's just taken time, you know, for me to uh, connect with people on a human level and have real conversations with people about these issues issues um, and get them to understand where I'm coming from, even if it's not their experience. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad we're in a church. I had to say a prayer before I did that. Okay, so quickly, that's all the time we have for four questions. I'm sorry. However, 
Um, we do have one more performance this evening from the DeKalb School of the Arts. So if everyone just stay seated. Actually, if everybody who's here, if y'all want to come and get a better view Ooh. and just sit around up here since you're young and you can get down on the floor and get back up from it, <laughs> that is perfectly fine. Ladies, do you all kind of want to get ready? Folks, could I get some help to get the chairs? Misty, do you want to stick around for this yes, one? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you all so, so much for coming. Thank you, Misty. Thank you. Perfect. Again, so very, very much for coming. Folks, stand up again and take a bow. Ladies, DeKalb School of Arts, take another bow. <laughs> Have a wonderful holiday season. Ladies and gentlemen, Misty Copeland. We will see you all again in 2023. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>